like even in Vancouver, they're like they're popping up everywhere, right? It's SaaS is probably the best business model that I've encountered uh, currently existing today. Finding good talent within a tech space because we're competing with a lot of different talents. Like how do you solve that problem? Welcome to another episode of the Dan Lok Show. I am so excited. I haven't done one of these in, in a few weeks because we just finished our annual event for all my students from all over the world, closers in Black. Now, today is a very, very special interview. As you know, every single time I bring on a guest, we talk about entrepreneurship, we talk about sales, we talk about marketing. But today I want to focus on a huge trend that's happening right now, right? And that's remote work. But also, if you're an entrepreneur, I know a lot of my listeners are entrepreneurs, you're also going to get some insights on how to scale your company much more rapidly, okay? Let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Leah Martin is a serial entrepreneur who runs Time Doctor and Staff.com, one of the most popular time tracking and productivity software platforms in use by top brands today. He's also the co-organizer of the world's largest remote work conference running remote. Also a fellow Canadian. Liam, welcome <laughs> to the show. Thanks for having me, Dan. Uh, always, I always want curious to know, before we talk about what you do today, I want to talk about why you do what you do. Like, how did you get into uh, this space? Sure. So, I mean, I can roll back a couple of years to how I got into this industry, which was actually started in Montreal, Canada at McGill University. For, yes. If you're Canadian, you probably yes. know of McGill. I was a graduate student there and uh, I was basically, I had spent about seven years as an undergrad and got into graduate school and that was my mission. That was what I was going to do with my life. And I was given my fir very first class. Uh, and for anyone that understands, you know, the university system, basically graduate students are given really crappy amounts of money to be able to run these, uh, these first year classes. Long story short, I was a horrible professor. I started with about 300 students and ended up with a little bit above 150 and got some of the worst reviews in the history of the sociology department. Oh my goodness. So I walked into my supervisor's office and I said, I don't think I'm very good at this. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, okay, so where does that leave us? He said, well, you know, you really got to get better at this teaching thing if you want to continue on into academia. Mm -hmm. So four weeks later, I literally threw one of the worst master's theses under his door and I was out into the real world. And what I recognized from that is that I really enjoyed teaching, but I wasn't a very good lecturer. So I turned that into mm -hmm. a remote tutoring business. So I had dozens of tutors throughout North America and Europe that were teaching students and ran into this really interesting situation, which was, well, if we just take this remote, then we can double or triple our overall productivity. And that's what we did. Mm. We went from dozens of tutors to hundreds of tutors. And uh, that actually turned into the very next product, which mm. was Time Doctor, our time tracking tool, because it was very difficult to be able to know exactly how long a tutor worked with a student when you're talking about remote people that are countries or nation or continents apart. So mm. literally we would say, okay, well, Jimmy, you said that you worked with this guy for 10 hours, but in reality you only worked with him for five. So we'd end up having to refund the student for the hours worked. And then we'd have to actually pay the tutor for the full amount. This was right. creating a serious problem inside of that business. Mm. So time doctor was that solution. And that's how I got into software. That's fascinating because you like teaching, but you, want, you don't want to teach within the school system. You enjoy teaching outside uh, of the school system. I mean, we can talk about that in a greater, you know, probably for another podcast. But yes. fundamentally for me, I think that the education system is not just stuck to this on-premise, go to a physical space and learn what you need to learn. I mean, mm. everyone has the internet. Anyone can get 20 PhDs worth of information within... Mm at their fingertips instantaneously if they want to. It's just desire Correct. and focus. Correct. Correct. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And it's not just stuck, in, but at the same time, a lot of the education where it's outdated with what's happening right now, a lot of young people follow what I do and they come to me because they feel like, okay, I'm following that path. I'm getting a degree, but then 
now what? Because chances are that sometimes the job to industries that they're preparing for by the time they graduate, th- th- those jobs may not be around. Those industries may not be around. I don't know whether or not you hire the same way that I do, but I don't look at education. It's really one of the things that I don't even touch on. For yep. me, it is, do you have the experience to be able to do the job? Yep. And can you show me some example of critical thinking? Yes. Some way that you've been able to think outside of the box, because I yes. work in a tech startup, yes. things change a lot. Yes. You need to be very adaptable. Yes. And for anyone that's listening to this podcast right now, who yeah. is maybe entering the workspace, yeah. that's what's critical. You need to be able to adapt to different situations. That's yeah. so much more important than whether you went to Yale or MIT. This is fascinating. Because the same thing with our company, well, I'm never ever high based on a resume. I always tell them, send me a video, sell me why I should hire you. And I just give mm. them tasks. Because I said, people lie on the resume. I don't care. And if people lie in the interview, I, I give them tasks and see how they perform. That tells me mm. everything, everything I need to know. And I would tell them, we're going to put you like a 30-day, 60-day through of hell. Right? You get through that, you're good. And that's how I hire, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'd be very, very upfront. So talk to us about, because it's fascinating how Time Doctor is. It was a problem you were solving for your own business. When did you make the switch and say, okay, you know what? Maybe other companies need this too. They would have this problem as well. So when anyone think, is thinking about building a tech product, mm. I really believe you have such a huge advantage if you're scratching your own itch. Mm. So if you have not built something for yourself, yes. you at least know, well, there's one customer and that customer was me. Yes. And I ran this business and I had this problem and I would have been a multi-thousand dollar a month customer for this yes. particular product. Yes. So there must be more of me. And that's probably not the perfect way of understanding your core market, but at mm. least it's a very good beginning place mm. to know how you can scale that out. So that. you start with yourself, number one, figure out what that core need is and then move out from there. But then secondarily, this has really evolved over the last couple of years because me and my co-founder have been running this for eight years. We've moved from... This is, and, and for anyone that's in the tech space right now, mm. I mean, it's never been a better time to be able to build a tech company than mm. right now today. Uh, it's so exciting. You know, we were in the days when we had to actually set up our own server racks. Now you have AWS, you have Amazon Azure, you can yeah. instantly deploy a system and you can be up and running for pennies. Mm. So we're in a very interesting time. And for us, we've now switched from just a monetary goal to a mission based goal. So mm. that's yeah. what is really driving us into the mm. future, mm. which is we see this huge opportunity for remote work that is number one, obviously going to make all companies a lot more productive and make us all a lot more money. But then secondarily, it also makes people a lot happier. It is actually mm. the number one thing, the single most important thing that you can do inside of a company to make your employees happier is to give them a remote work agreement. So we mm. feel like we can kind of if we can communicate that to the rest of the world, then at least we'll make the world suck just a little bit less. And then also you can see most people, they spend, they waste so much time commuting to work, right? It's oh, absolutely. An hour, an hour going to work, maybe two hours rush hour traffic coming back. It's, it's we actually have a, we have a dashboard metric, which is the amount of tons of carbon yes. that Time Doctor has saved. Yes. Yeah. Because every time you fly in a jet, you get on a train, you get in a car, uh, those commutes add up. And so there are environmental concerns, there are mental concerns. Um, it really is one of the best ways to work. And unless you've done it, you don't really get it. But once mm. you've done it, I think 96% of people that have a remote work agreement in place do not want to go back to an office model. That makes a lot of sense. And I can see how we think so much alike. I could see the trend. You, you, you described that as remote. I described that as like independent contractors. I call, I call that the skill economy. No longer yes. the job economy, right? Um, and I talk about well, that in my book, the same thing. That's another really important point to touch on as well, which is uh, at last year's Running Remote, which is the conference that we run, we had the story of Fahim. So mm-hmm. Fahim is uh, a person from Bangladesh. He has muscular dystrophy. Mm. Uh, He went from begging in the streets to saving up as much money as he could to be able to buy a laptop. And now he is working on Fiverr, which is a gig website. Yes. And he's doing design work on Fiverr. And he's making thousands of dollars a month, Mm. literally going from making a dollar a day to making tens of dollars a day, Mm. $100 a day. To him, it's huge. It's, it's huge. And so that's the machine that's really changing. And for anyone that's listening to this, that's in the Western market, mm. 
the Fahims of the world are coming after your job and they should, because if you're not the best, then obviously the market is always going to choose the best. We mm-hmm. live in a free market society. So mm-hmm. capitalism is a thing. So yes. you need to be able to make sure that you have the skills to be able to survive the next one, two, three decades. And that future will be remote. Mm, I love that. So talk to us, uh, how does that also transition to like staff.com? How does that come to the picture? Sure. So time doctor and staff.com are fundamentally the same thing. So for okay. us, we really saw staff.com as an enterprise product and everyone loves that. You know, we have mm. a very flashy domain name. Um, mm. There's a bit of a funny story behind that. Yeah, basically. share that story because I, I, I know I know how expensive domain names are. <laughs> sure. So, yes. I mean, for us, we actually, we really wanted to build a, a company that had a strong branding behind it. Mm-hmm. And uh, we mm-hmm. actually started with mystaff.com. And then okay. we were kind of poking at staff.com. And I think it was about 400000 from a domainer at that point. Mm. And uh, we were negotiating back and forth. And he said, do we really need that type of brand impression? Then, unfortunately, uh, he came back about six months later, said, hey, I have another buyer for the domain. Mm. And by the way, the price has gone from 400 to 450 We don't know whether or not we had that buyer, but we ended up buying it. And then after that, we actually ran an experiment where we did a cold outreach from our Time Doctor email, and we did the same amount of cold outreaches from our at staff.com email. Mm. And our at staff.com email had double the open rate and the response rate as our Time Doctor email, just because of the brand impression. So we uh, realized that it was money well spent. Uh, yes, yes. And, and I felt the same way. So when I bought closest.com, when I then later bought copywriters.com, it's, it, there's a huge difference. There's a Absolutely. huge difference. And, and I notice even when I meet with people, sometimes, you know, you do your elevator pitch and people ask you what you do. And I kind of explain that. But now when I say, oh, I'm the founder and CEO of closest.com, like it's an instant, oh, interesting. Tell me more. And then, right. then I go on explaining what we do. I, I just feel that just that alone, it's worth the investment. And of course, oh, the SEO and on the search engine traffic and then all that comes in. I'm also, I want to know about this, that uh, with the SaaS, some of the challenges, a lot of the tech founders, I found that they sometimes very focus on much on, on the technology, right? They, they spend a lot of time and money. Oh, let me get the perfect product, the perfect, not, not even minimum viable product. I want to make it perfect before I get out to the marketplace. Like throughout your journey, what are some of the, the things that you believe you did right? And what are some of the things that you did wrong that you learned from? So biggest thing that I think uh, I could tell other founders that want to start a SaaS mm-hmm. business. Number one, SaaS is probably the best business model that I've encountered uh, currently existing today. The barrier to entry is incredibly low. Yeah. You can get into it for twenty to $30,000 and you mm-hmm. can have something that will generate not just a single amount of cash, but will have a recurring model yes. um, way into the future. Yes. But one of the biggest problems that we had is uh, not running our beta, and not running to a paid beta faster. Mm, so okay. we had a free beta and we had hundreds of thousands of people that were using our product yeah. and we were so terrified about moving to a, to a paid product. Yeah. It's so a freemium and, to premium, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's a free product. You can just try it and then eventually we're going to charge for it. And mm. we were, we had all these users that were testing the system. Mm. So we went and we actually pulled the trigger. I remember that day very clearly. Uh, we had about, three to 4% of our user base actually pay for it, Mm. uh, which was, we thought was a disaster, but Mm. something very interesting happened, Mm. which was Time Doctor is a time tracking product. Our major Mm. metric is how many hours someone tracks on our system. Mm. So the amount of hours that we were tracking tripled. So we only had 4% of people that paid for the product, Mm. but our overall use of the product tripled by those Mm. 4%. Yes. And what's really important to understand inside of that is you need to have someone that's paying for your product. It mm. doesn't matter what the price is, mm. a dollar, a penny, get them to open up their wallet mm. and they will send you something that is so powerful, uh, but everyone kind of moves away from it, which is yes. hate mail, angry messages. Oh, hey, yes. this software is a piece of crap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't yeah. like this thing anymore. Please yeah. fix it. Yeah. Because I'm paying for it. And yeah. you need those passionate users. Um, the users that we get, at least at the beginning stages, really gave us the understanding of how to build the product into the future. And if mm. we hadn't had those customers actually actively emailing us back, mm. we wouldn't have been able to be able to build the product that we have today. 
That's a, that's a great tip because, you know, what people pay, they pay attention, right? It's, they yes. can say, I, I like this, I like that, I don't like this. Well, they're not going to be a paying customers. The 4% tells you everything that you need to know because they're using it. Plus, they're telling you, hey, I like this, I don't like that because they're paying customers, right? <laughs> One of the things that we do when we add a new feature to any software product that we have is we describe the feature to the customer. And we say, well, this is what the future is going to do. Mm. Do you want to get it? Yes. Would you like it? Yes. So Dan, if I asked you, would you like a new feature on something that you use in a software product? You'd probably yeah. say yes. Yeah, why not? It doesn't, yeah, sure, right? right? That's what everybody would say. That's what everybody would say. Yeah. So the next question is, well, how much would you pay for it? Oh, that's like, mm, I don't know, maybe 10 bucks a month, maybe five bucks right. a month or whatever it or is. Or maybe yeah. I wouldn't pay for it at all. Mm, yes. So then after we know whether they would pay for it, then we say, well, we just happen to have a fantastic price. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh, for you or pricing price, price for you, it is $5 a month. Mm. Why don't you buy it right now? And yes. uh, we'll put you in for the beta program. And that's how you really start to see where people are going. Also, yes. it's really important. We, had, we learned this from Eric Ries, yes. uh, who wrote the book, uh, kind of the Bible on basically building initial tech startups. He invented yes. the concept called the minimum viable product. Yes. And he had the idea of literally putting features on your app before mm. they were built. Yes. So literally a link to them. Yes. And you would click on it. And when you click on it, it would say, this feature isn't built yet. What up. do you think this feature should look like? And mm. would you like to buy it? Mm. And you're getting that direct feedback to know, mm. well, where is your customer going? Because if you mm. build the wrong feature, mm. uh, we actually built a project management feature inside of Time Doctor. Mm. It cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars mm. and no one used it because we didn't properly ask the customer. One of the challenges, even with my SaaS, I found that because to me, it's a, we're expanding is still a new, new arena for me, a new area. I've only been doing it for a couple of years that finding good talent within a tech space because we're competing with a lot of different talents. Like how do you solve that problem? So we have about a hundred and ish people in 32 different countries all over the world. So yes. we hire remote. We're what we call a remote first company as opposed right. to on-premise companies uh, for everyone that's an internet nerd an on-premise rack is where you'd put your server racks in the nice. old school way of doing business. Yes. It's a crappy way of doing business. Yes. Cloud labor is the way to go. Yes. So we hire from anywhere on planet earth. And actually, if you want to get very tactical about it, yes. uh, Eastern Europe is probably the best place to be able to find developers on mm. planet earth right now okay. uh, in okay. terms of their cost efficiency. So mm. you can hire developers that are probably as good as developers in Toronto or Palo Alto or New York for about half the cost. And that's a really powerful tool to use mm. to be able to leverage a lot more developers to be able to get more lines written and your app up and running faster. How do you keep uh, have different developers working together? Like how do you lead that team so that they, this, this developer from, from this country is working on this and that? Like how do you organize that? So we usually have cells that we run. So okay. um, like, like we'll have a front end team, a back end okay. team, okay. we'll have all of these different organizations and then we'll have team leaders and then that's obviously led by a CTO and a scrum master. Got um, it. But, you really would want to choose. So like, as an example, if you want to hire some of the best people in customer service and mm. customer support, mm. it's probably going to be located in the Philippines mm. or other countries in Southeast Asia because mm. they speak English. They actually have a ton of experience in interacting with front end customers in English. Yeah. Um, yes. It's a fantastic location for that. In terms of development, we actually hire a lot of talent from Canada mm, uh, because they are very well educated. Yep. And um, they're about 75 cents to the dollar yep. to the U.S. market. Yes. And then we also hire people in the United States. So we actually have a very multifaceted team. Yeah. And what we do is we say, we're not going to find the best developer in Vancouver. Yes. We're going to find the best developer on planet Earth for this price point. Mm. And that's all that we do is we literally just say, this is how much we have. Our market is the global stage. Let's mm -hmm. go to find that person. Um, the process... Today, I literally went through about 800 resumes. <laughs> that's pretty much my job right now is just yes. finding good talent people. and trying yes. to figure out who those people are because that's so critical mm. to building your business. Mm. Um, but it is the global market. So I've seen candidates today from Mauritius. I've seen candidates from Singapore, nice. from Tokyo, from nice. everywhere on planet Earth today. 
you just go to job sites and you post? Like, what are some of the ways you you you, you recruit? <clears throat> so, some of the best platforms is WeWork remotely, Remotive.com, Flexjobs.com. Um, if you want to do smaller projects, Upwork is another great place. If you even want to go to smaller uh, contract sites, uh, Fiverr is another Fiverr, fantastic yeah. one where yeah. you can find a lot of great low cost talent um, yeah. or effective talent to do a particular job. So yeah. it really depends on your situation. But mm. for us, we generally approach job boards where people are looking for remote first working mm. agreements. Mm. And that's a really easy way for us to be able to get candidates in. Mm. And do you do, uh, work with them like per project or per term? No, so for us, um, it's it's an interesting situation because mm. we are a US corporation, but we, yes. have, we have a few subsidiaries, but fundamentally we don't have 32. Yes. And everyone works as a contractor. So it's yes. very easy to be able to get in. And for anyone that needs to understand the difference, a yes. contractor needs to purchase their own equipment they should not be in an office and yep. they don't have any set work hours. So yep. fundamentally for us, we know that uh, we don't care where you work or when you work as long as you get your work done. So yes. that allows them to be a contractor and uh, it also allows you to be able to enter the job market even faster because we can start yeah. with someone within an hour if we really want to. Yes, yes. And then you give them different tasks and then see how they do. If they do good, then they give them more and more projects, right? Exactly. And then they're actually awesome. working pretty much full time. Um, right. After about a three month period, if they've been yes. working with us, yes. we then kind of make them full time and uh, they're a full time contractor for us. I love it. And then you say basically you have sell um, in my company, I call that pot, right? It's a little pot where you have the five, six, seven people, you have a, a leader managing that pot and then that leader reports to the CTO, right? Yeah. So we have sales of uh, seven people max. There's yes. a sociological rule and this is if you're at a party and you see seven people in a group yeah. and you see an eighth person enter that group, yeah. every single time you'll see those two, you'll see that one group turn into two. Interesting. So seven people is the maximum amount that you can have for a yeah. small kind of crew. Yes. And uh, so we keep them to seven and we find that if it's larger than that, the teams just don't work as easily. And let's say for an entrepreneur listening to this and they're thinking about, okay, this, this makes a lot of sense. Maybe I have a group of, of, of staff. I want to maybe test it out, like the, having some more independent contractors and, and remote workers. What would be your first like, step? If they're a little bit scared, they're a little bit, like the companies, they'll be on the fence, right? Sure. So, I mean, if you have an on-premise team right now, if you have people in your office, what I would suggest that you do is take, <clears throat> don't put, make everyone remote. That'll be a disaster. Now, uh, there are fundamental differences between managing a remote team and managing an office team. Mm. Uh, so what, what, what do you would, think is the big, biggest difference? The biggest one that I see in my clients is operational processes are so critical inside of remote businesses. And funnily enough, it will actually make your business a lot more efficient if you have standard operating procedures inside mm. of your organization. But yeah. in remote businesses, you have to have more SOPs earlier to be able to function. Because if you have like, you know, Suzanne in the office that's always made coffee in one particular way. Well, is there an SOP for how Suzanne makes coffee? Mm. Maybe not. Mm. Who knows? Well, if Suzanne disappears tomorrow, there's no more coffee in the office. No one knows what the heck is going on. So mm. all of those things have to be documented and digitized mm. so you can put them in some type of a platform and then mm. I can say well here are all the standard operating procedures so that no one is frozen in time because sometimes we'll have employees where there'll be a 12 hour delay between their direct reports and, mm, yes. and, uh, and, and the employee. Of. So yeah. you need to be able to actually have those processes in place mm. to know what people are doing and what they're doing with their time. Makes sense. That makes sense. I think right there, there's already a pretty, pretty important distinction. So they need to have kind of what you're saying is more clear communications up front, right? Setting expectations up front because it's, we're not seeing each other face to face. It's easy to have confusion, right? So you also do video calls. I mean, those are absolutely critical to be able to get some level of communication. I have a hierarchy of like communication for remote teams, which is mm -hmm. In person is better than video. Video is better than audio. Audio is better than instant messaging and instant messaging is better than email. So I always try to run up that ladder, never yes. down. So if yes. there's 10 instant messages on Slack that go back yes. and forth, Both. I try to get to a phone call as quickly as possible to actually mm. resolve that issue. Mm. So it's really important to be able to move up that rack, make sure that you have that type of communication. Mm. Uh, a lot of stuff that we communicate as humans is nonverbal. 
So having someone on video is really important. So dad, if you told me to do something that I really didn't want to do, if I was just on audio, I would say, yeah, okay, that sounds like I'd do that. But then if you see it on my face that I really don't want to do it. I would love to do that, right? (laughs) right. You'd be like, okay, well, what's the issue here? Do you have a problem with that? Do you not know what to do next? You know, you need to be able to have that type of nonverbal communication. And thankfully, with the internet, we have that capability. And so for someone, uh, let's say for one of your users, how would they use Time Doctor to do that? Like how would the software help? Sure. For us, what it does is, number one, it tells you exactly what that person is doing. So right now, I'm doing podcasts with Dan. Yes. And I'm adding that to the 387 other different podcasts that I've done over the last two years that are Mm. in my own personal deployment of Time Doctor. And I have all the data connected to exactly how and what I was doing with it, what applications I'm using, how I'm interacting with Zoom or Skype or whatever it might be. And then I can get those metrics and I can figure out Number one, what's the cost of me doing this? It's a good ROI. And then secondarily, how can I make this process more efficient? So we use Mm. a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence Mm. to be able to tell you what can you do to be able to make yourself a lot more efficient, your day a lot more efficient. So Mm. as an example, I take Tuesday afternoons off. And only after a few months of collecting this data, I was starting to get a really strong signal for Tuesday afternoons that I was not productive. Mm. And since you're Canadian, you probably know this. I don't think they do this in the US, but Mm. in Canada, we have cheap movie nights on Tuesday Mm. afternoons. Mm. And me and my partner, we always go out to cheap movie nights on Tuesdays. Mm. It's kind Mm. of our thing. Mm. So the calls start at around 2 p.m. on this thing where I'll get a call from her saying, well, should we go to Superman or to Batman? And Mm. I'm obviously a Batman guy. Mm. And she would say, well, I want to go to Superman. Mm. Well, Dan wants to go to some, Dan wants to go to Iron Man mm-hmm. as an example. Yes, yes. Why don't you call Dan and figure it out? Mm-hmm. Well, are we going to go to the five o'clock showing or the seven o'clock showing? And this mm-hmm. was a distraction machine. I call this stuff the distraction economy. Everyone mm-hmm. is trying to actually get your attention. So you need to be able to be mindful of it. So I realized to enjoy myself a lot more, I'll just take Tuesday afternoons off completely from work and my mm-hmm. productivity went up which is a little bit counterintuitive, Mm. but realizing focused work time is probably one of the most important resources that you have for yourself and in any business. So you you can optimize that. You're going to have not only a more productive individual, but a more productive company. See if I understand this correctly. So what what gets measured gets improved because by measuring how they use the time and by you, not micromanaging, but being able to keep track of what, your remote staff is doing, right? Now you can see, hmm, hey, John, last this task, I think it should take five hours, but actually it took you 15 hours. There's there's, there's, there's a gap here, right? Let me give you a more concrete example. Um, You know sales, you're great at it. Yes. You have your sales team of 100 reps. Yeah. Time Doctor can come in and can analyze what makes your great salespeople great and what makes your bad salespeople bad. not good at their job? Yeah, probably and distracted, then, doing other things. And not are they distracted? On. So where are they putting their time? So we mm. start to see really interesting data points pop up of, well, the best salespeople are actually on the phones 25% more often mm. than the worst salespeople. Mm. Or maybe they're actually working a lot less mm. per hour, per hours per day mm. than the people that are not very good Mm. um, in sales. So we're Mm. able to see all of those trends, which Mm. generally happens through machine learning and artificial intelligence. And then we can present that data to not only your high performers, but your low performers to be able to make sure that everyone can become more productive. For as a CEO, do I, how do I uh, read or interpret that that data? Or is this someone from time doctor help me kind of, through the process kind of do it. I mean, we have customer success teams, but fundamentally it's a self-serve product. So you'd yes. be able to ver- think of it as Fitbit for work. Got it. So got if it. you've got a Fitbit right now, then you understand see. your metrics, you understand how long you slept. Well, if I'm getting really good night's sleep, I'm more productive. I'm getting more steps per day. It's in essence the same thing with Time Doctor, but just with your work. Wow. I love it. I love it. I love it. So um, talk, so talk to us about uh, the conference. Like how sure. did you come up with the idea? Running I mean, that's my baby. So that's the thing yes. that I do on the weekends that, that I really love to do. Uh, yes. So I have a passion for remote work as mm. I think you probably yes. have heard. We can all tell. Podcast. We can all tell. Yes. yes. 
And I think that the future is remote. So I believe that everyone on planet Earth one day will be able to have the opportunity to work remotely. And once you get that opportunity, you'll probably mm. never want it to leave. So mm. we had our team retreat in Boracay in the Philippines, which is kind of the party island in the Philippines, if uh, no one has ever checked it out or knows mm. of it. Mm. And we had about 100 people at that point. And we said, well, we need to get to 150, 200 people within the next year. How do we do that? And he started mm. looking for information on that. And there's a mm. whole bunch of information about hiring mm. your first remote employee mm. or your second remote employee, mm. but there's very little about building real businesses remotely. And mm. there was nothing on the internet and yep. there was no talks. So we said to ourselves, man, it was a bit of a ready, fire, aim type of situation. Yes. I cut a check for the venue and yes. we ran the first year, which thankfully we sold out for and yes. we've run another event since then and we're running our third event now. And basically it is just a conference building and scaling remote teams, which is really an interesting new phenomenon that's starting to pop up right now. It wouldn't be interesting because very often I think, it is not a new concept. I mean, even back then, 10 years ago, I started having uh, independent contractors outsourcing uh, different works and graphics. Back then, it was like newer uh, when, I, when I started on the internet. People think of that, oh, because you are like a you know, work at home, small business, and you don't have a lot of resources, and that's why you need to do this. What we are talking about here is now the switch. Wouldn't it be interesting? Maybe it is already one, but wouldn't it be interesting if this is the first you know, billion dollar company that's 100% remote. Right? It's called Envision. Right? Or WordPress. So Envision, 850 people, entirely remote, billion dollar company in three years. Boom. WordPress, 3,000 remote employees. They just shut down all of their offices entirely remote. GitLab and GitHub, both entirely remote. This is something that people don't really recognize at this point is mm. massive tech companies are all going remote because they understand the core fundamentals and the unit economics of remote first companies, which is on average. Mm. And there's a lot of data to kind of unpack inside of that, but they're 40% more productive than on-premise companies. And a remote employee is 40% more cost-effective than an on-premise one. And to kind of boil in or to kind of unpack that metric, mm. Mm. they're on average about 20% more productive but more importantly, and this is something that a lot of CEOs don't recognize, mm. they have a 30% better retention rate than their on-premise counterparts. Mm. And when you fire an employee, on average, it costs you $42,000 to replace them. Or if yep. a remote employee quits, it yep. costs on average $42,000 to replace them. Yep. So those dollars and cents end up counting in a huge way. Right now, it's in the tech industry because everyone that's doing work on their computer, it's very easy to be able to automate that process. Yeah. But I see this moving out into all industries. We had someone at Running Remote that actually pours concrete in Chicago, has mm. 300 employees, and they want to be able to take their entire logistics team remote because it's going to make their employees a lot happier. Mm, and then everything running more, more efficiently because of technology that can help to facilitate and manage a lot of these different things. That guy that's dropping those foundations in Chicago and probably he has five or six major competitors. Mm. He just made his company 20% more cost effective than his competitors. So he can lower his costs by 20%. It, it is an inevitability. Count this right now. Mm. I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this statement within 10 years, being remote will be the standard. People mm. will say, well, of course, if I'm going to work on a computer, I'm not going to go into an office. It's ridiculous mm. for me to go into an office. Mm. Maybe they'll be at co-working spaces. They'll be at something else other than a company purchasing the direct infrastructure to actually house those people. And it will make mm. people a lot happier. And do you find, is it maybe also that's why now with this co-working space that it's more popular than ever, like even in Vancouver, they're like, they're popping up everywhere, right? It's we work and there's so many others, right? Yeah. And we'll see how we work goes. Uh, yeah. As of recording this right now, I think they're in a bit of a flux, yes. but you're absolutely right. I think that there's a huge revolution too. And I kind of almost call it like cloud office spaces. So, mm, you know, we've mm. got the cloud for everything. So mm. what if you had, uh, we work is an essence an infrastructure where you can go anywhere on planet earth to any major city and you can find a WeWork. And if you have a WeWork account, mm -hmm. you can go in and you, you can work in that space. Yep, yep. Um, and so large companies are now starting to adopt this model where they're realizing Regis is another company that's doing this yeah, Regis, where yeah. mm -hmm. you will have, it will be illogical for you 
to hire or to purchase a really expensive office somewhere when instead you can sublease it from someone else and you can have the movement to be able to, or the freedom to be able to move people wherever you want Mm. and just have a much more um, dynamic workforce that can go anywhere and are also more productive. Do you find that like one of the, one of the, at least that's one of my challenges. I would love to get your feedback on this, that when I work with, because we have remote workers, we're independent contractors and they are, some of them are phenomenal, right? They buy into the culture, they, they, they immerse into the culture. Uh, just culture is very important just for, for what I do. And I just find that people who are in like face to face with me, the culture, it's much, it's very different from versus someone I, you know, I had a graphic designer from, from whatever country. Like how yeah. do I overcome that? So we do it with our in-team retreats. <clears throat> so every year we have a team retreat where everyone flies into one place and that is almost entirely a culture uh, session. So for mm. us, uh, we actually, I don't have it in front of me right now, mm-hmm. but every single company or every single new employee to the company gets our mission statement, what we stand for, and they get it as a plaque and they mm. actually have to put it in their office. And mm. we have, you have to show us where you have it mm. so that you're always committing back to that. We also have all of our customer avatars. So we have these posters mm. of the customers that we serve mm. and we put them up in the office to be able to, their own, their own home offices, to be able to understand who is the customer that we serve? Mm. Why are we doing this? Mm. What are we doing that's not just getting paid? So for us, mm. our mission statement is we want to empower everyone on planet Earth to work wherever they want, whenever they want. Mm. That's the mission statement. That's mm. why we would do something crazy like a conference that yeah. really doesn't make us that much money, yeah. but it helps with that core mission statement of being able to facilitate remote work. Yes. So yes. it is not necessarily as effective. I think that having the team very close to you is obviously uh, a more effective model. But when you add in the overall productivity and yeah. happiness of your employees, yeah. it ends up becoming a better model when you look at it from a unit economics perspective. Right, right. That makes sense. And so for, let's say for someone who is, I want to talk about, let's say they're doing decent amount of revenue, but they now they want to scale to the, the next level, right? Now they're thinking, they're listening to this talk, they're listening to this interview and say, okay, this, 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 this good, this is good. Maybe this is something that I, that I could do. What, what other advice would you have for them? So get your operational processes in place. If you don't have them in place, it's absolutely critical. Whether you want to go remote or not, it mm-hmm. will be a three month process that you'll come out of and you'll now have a guidebook. You'll have an entire handbook on exactly how to run your business. Mm. Uh, if you want to actually go steal one, if you go to about.gitlab.com slash handbook, you'll actually get the entire 3,200 page remote operational guide for GitLab. Everything that they do in their business. If you want to see how they run a sales demo, it's in there. If you want to know the stock options you mm. get when you go join GitLab, it's all in there. So mm. get that, steal it, <laughs> repurpose it for yourself. Yes. And then you at least have some type of processes in place. Mm-hmm. Then just start with the process and start slowly. Don't put everyone remote right away. Everyone will jump at this opportunity if you actually mm-hmm. open this up into mm-hmm. your office. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you need to do this process slowly. So I suggest remote Fridays or just take one person and make them remote. Mm-hmm. Try it for one month. Very clearly identify what are the key responsibility areas and the metrics that you need to hit, which is also an interesting phenomenon inside of remote companies versus on-premise. Very few managers actually clearly identify metrics. Mm. And so taking them remote actually allows you to run an exercise to say, well, what are the actual numbers that you have to hit at the end of the day, as opposed Mm. to refilling the coffee cups and making sure that everyone's having fun. So put all those metrics in place and then just execute and see whether or not you can make that happen. Um, The worst that basically is going to happen to you is you're going to lose maybe a month of salary from one employee, but the best is you're going to increase productivity 40% across the board. Mm. And then within your company, I guess you, you, you see have some people that are kind of on, on salary, but a lot of those are more like project based. The faster you finish the project, the, the faster you get paid, right? Is that, yeah, is that absolutely. Correct? So for us, it's again with people in 32 different countries all over the world, the majority of them are full-time people, but we still act like contractors. So at the Mm. end of the day, it is what are the things that you need to get done? And we measure everything. Mm. So it's actually quite interesting. Once you get past 
around the 100 person mark, 100 mm. to 150 person mark, mm. that's what they call the tribe number. Mm. So in small tribes 300,000 years ago, we would be able to know everyone in groups of 100 to 150 people. But once you go above 150 people, yeah. then people unfortunately start to become numbers. It's just the reality of business. Yeah. So then for us, we are really measuring those numbers to know, well, in my case, what does my direct report team do that are pulling numbers all the way up to me? And I can understand that very clearly because mm. we have those clear metrics in place. Mm. And then we mm. can basically optimize that depending upon the situation that we're in. Leon, do you have a story you maybe like one of your clients using like Time Doctor uh, that let's say they were at this size and by using the software, like, like a case study? Like that sure. Up. I mean, so we have so many stories of customers that are not just focused on um, scaling necessarily, but just mm. allowing them to get a more free environment. We kind of call, or getting them access to remote work, we kind of mm. call our product the Trojan horse of remote work. Mm. So every employer right now really wants to be able to get more clarity into what their people are doing and mm. to be able to make themselves and their team more productive. So yeah. I'll give you an example. Uh, we had someone in uh, one of our clients <clears throat> that ended up taking uh, their top developer, they started seeing um, World of Warcraft oh, okay. on, on their time doctor. Yes. So they said, well, what are you doing playing a World of Warcraft at work, dude? You know, like, wh what's the issue here? And he actually told them, listen, I, um, I have a real addiction to World of Warcraft. I go home and I play World of Warcraft for six or seven hours, I go to sleep for four hours, I wake up again, I come here and, and I go to work and then I go back and I do the same thing. And they said, well, is this affecting your life in a significant way? Mm. Well, yes, my, my wife hates me, I've got a newborn <laughs> kid, yeah. you know, it's, it's a real yeah. problem for me. Yeah. Yeah. And what they ended up doing is instead of just terminating that employee, which is what would have happened had they not had that early warning system in place, yeah. Yeah. they were able to actually get them a therapist get him a therapist. He had a DSM approved video game addiction. Mm. They got him to delete his character off of World of Warcraft. And now he's back to being one of the most productive employees inside of the company. So mm. it's one of those things. It's not just about tracking what people are doing, but making them more productive. That's what's so critical about remote work agreements and making sure that people are putting the right time into the business. I, I could even see that even for on-site employee, this would be very effective too. Absolutely. Uh, so for us, we deploy on on-site employees all the time. And yeah. then within the next couple of months, we start to see them start to go remote, which is why we call it the Trojan horse of remote work, because yes. we've solved the major problem for the employer. Every single employer that we go into, that's a large Fortune 500, says, mm -hmm. well, how do I know what they're doing? we solved that problem with Time Doctor instantaneously. Mm. Mm. And then they have the freedom to be able to have those workers go out into you know, their, their homes and, and work yeah. remotely or work working from wherever a, work, they want. Work in a park, work in whatever. It doesn't really matter as long as they, it gets done. Do you exactly. find that like how often should like the, the executive or the managers review the dashboard, looking at the results? It really depends. You know what? I have not looked at my... I look at my own data all the time, but I very rarely look at anyone else's data. And for us, we have an, we have an organization where everyone can look at everyone else's data. So mm. me as one of the co-founders of the company, everyone that works in the company can see the data that I am currently collecting. So everyone knows I'm on this podcast with you if they want yes. to take a look. Yes. And for me, that is such a fantastic playing field because they know if I'm working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, well, maybe they should be doing the same as well. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I love it. I love it. This is awesome. So for our listeners, if they want to find out a little bit more uh, about doing this or hiring the first independent worker, remote worker, or even finding a little bit more about the, the conference, uh, what's the best way to do that? Best way would be to go to timedoctor.com. We have a 14 day free trial and then go to running remote, uh, running remote.com. So you'll be able to learn everything you possibly can about all the speakers that are coming up. Um, we usually have it in pretty interesting locations this year. We're going to be doing it in Austin, Texas. So there's oh, nice. going to be good barbecue as well. Nice. Nice. Liam, I think, you know, I can sense you, you got to be working on a book of some kind. Uh, you you got to write a book, man. I mean, 
we'll talk about that later. Right. <laughs> I mean, with all this, I think that would bring more awareness to, to this entire movement. I completely agree with you. I think right now, no one is doing this or no one, everyone wants to do this, but no one really knows how to do it. Mm. And it's always been these nerdy guys like me that are just doing this kind of stuff. And we're realizing that it's going to completely change labor within the next one to two decades. Yeah. And it it feels like it's bits and pieces of information. Even myself, I got to kind of figure it out. And then we make mistakes, but no one, like you said, like there's a, a conference or even a, a resource, a book to say, okay, these are the steps. You do this and this and this and this, and these are the mistakes. Don't do these things. Uh, we try those. And these are the best practices. That would be, I think that would be phenomenal. One of the most interesting things that we've discovered with Running Remote is we brought in all of these, these fantastic founders that run eight, nine 10 figure companies. Uh, mm. Just this last year, we had the director of support from Shopify, Marcy nice. Murray, who went nice. from zero reps, zero support reps to 3,000 remote support reps in two years. Wow. So, just absolute massive scale when you can think about it. Yeah. The interesting thing is when we ask them about best practices, they all have different best practices. No yeah. one right now understands the playbook, no yes. one knows what to do properly. And the interesting thing, about that is everyone's doing something different. They're probably doing a lot of things that are wrong, but mm. because remote work is so advantageous, it doesn't matter. Mm. Everyone actually ends up having a positive ROI. Yes. So once we can actually standardize this, it's going to be even more oh. powerful. Yeah, hundred percent. Love it. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I learned a lot. I'm sending actually this to, to, to my, my COO and she should listen to this. I think this is very, very profound. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you.